so loved the world that he gave his only son with love he gave his life for me when he died on Calvary there is no greater love no greater love than a man lay down his life for a friend there is no greater love no greater love than a man would lay down his life for a friend there is no
Well, good morning, TBC family. So good to be back with you this morning. I pray that you are doing well, and I just praise God for being able to gather with you this morning in this way. Before we jump into this morning's uh, sermon and this morning's word, would you bow with me and let's pray and let's ask God's help as we navigate his word together today. Father God, I thank you for who you are. You are a good and gracious God, Lord. We we thank you for your loving kindness that you've shown towards us, Lord. It is a love that we don't deserve, but uh, because of your grace and your mercy, you've shown that love to us. And for that, Lord God, we are eternally thankful. Lord God, I pray now as we delve into the word together that you would give us utterance. Give me clarity of speech, Lord God, and clarity of mind. Allow the word to come forth with, with power, only power that comes from you. That's the only power that, that is available, that, that is able to transform and to convict and challenge and encourage and uplift our hearts, Lord God. That's what we need today. I pray, Lord God, for your people as we hear the word today that you till our hearts, prepare us, Lord. Make our hearts good ground so that we can hear your word and grow thereby. Lord God, I love you. I thank you for who you are. I thank you for your word. And we just thank you for Jesus. It's in his matchless and powerful name that we pray. Amen. Well, I pray uh, that this week you've received a number of announcements that have gone out this week. Uh, namely, uh, next week, next Sunday, the 7th, first Sunday of February. Uh, it is our goal to, to reconvene and regather physically in, in physical worship uh, together in person. And so... Um, I pray that during the 11 o'clock hour that you uh, come out. I hope you've seen the, the announcements and seen all that it uh, goes into in terms of the safety protocols that we have in place. But I pray that you're able to come out. And uh, I understand that this is something that continues to be um, um, going and prevalent within our society. And there's certainly different comfort levels. Um, please know that if you if you decide to join us online, that you are certainly uh, worshiping alongside and with us and, and certainly not apart from us. And so we respect that and we totally understand that and, and we continue to pray and operate with grace with one another. And so the stream and all of those things will continue to be active so that we can continue to worship in, in, in those different, uh, different ways. In addition to that, uh, on the 10th Wednesday evening, we're going to do our annual membership meeting, just a little bit different this year. We're going to have it uh, in person as well as online. And so more details will be forthcoming on, on that. I hope you received the, the uh, officer uh, uh, nominations that went out this week, as well as the annual report um, so that you can review that and, and um, fill out your, your ballots so that we can uh, continue to do uh, the business of the church. Well, I praise God for you again joining us this morning. And I'm going to ask if you got your Bibles, if you would meet me in Job chapter 38. Job chapter 38. Job chapter 38. This, this morning we are going to bring our series on the book of Job to a close. And the book of Job has been a blessing to me and I pray that it's been a blessing to you. The book of Job, it is a significant book. It is presented in a way that it gives us an opportunity to challenge our understanding, our perspective, our view, and our theology on suffering, of, of what it means when we go through difficult and dark times as the people of God and followers of God. And it, and it confronts us with the hard question of why do the righteous those who are godly and those who are right before God. Why do they suffer? In Job, we certainly see a real person going through real suffering, having a real hard time understanding what he's going through. And subsequently, throughout the book, he asks some real questions. If you've not been with us or if you've not read the book of Job, Job uh, is an upright, he's a godly man, he's a blameless man, he's a man of integrity, he's a man that God calls an upright and godly man. And he gets caught up in this whirlwind of, of, of painful events and calamity. In the very first chapter, we see what Job goes through. He loses his 
children. He loses all of his possessions and his wealth. His, his marriage becomes uh, uh, sort of on the rocks. He has to deal with that. And, and eventually Job also loses his health in many ways. Job, in one setting, checks all of the boxes of suffering. When we think about suffering, we normally think about going through one thing, but, but Job seems to be going through all of the things, everything, all, all at one time. Job is broke, he's dealing with grief, and Job is sick. He, he's, he's dealing with all of the problems that one could have. Job deals with everything. This causes Job to become depressed and very dark in his thinking. Job begins to wonder and, and think that God has changed. He, he begins to, to really uh, have sort of his faith kind of waver a bit. He, he begins to have some concerns. He begins to wonder whether or not God is still on his side. In fact, Job comes to a conclusion to think that God is against him. He struggles with this thought process. As we navigate it throughout this book, and a big portion of this book is the fact that a few of Job's friends, they, they come alongside him. They come um, to, to, to support him and to, to comfort him, and they step in. But the reality is, is that they don't help Job at all. Instead of helping him out of the dark hole that he is in, they, they actually end up pushing Job deeper into despair. With bad theology, they attempt to convince Job that his suffering is the result of God punishing Job for something he has done. They have no idea what Job has done, but, but they bring the accusation to him to say, man, if you're suffering like this, you must be uh, getting punished by God for doing something wrong. Job who takes inventory of his life, takes issue with that, having searched his life and finding no glaring outward sin that he's done, he has done, he, he begins to think that God may be picking on him, may be mistreating him, may have changed towards him, may just look at him as if he is his enemy. Because of Job's friend's baseless and bad argument, Job is left to think, if God is not punishing me, then God must be picking on me. God must have changed. Where God was once in my corner, he now rejects me and opposes me. Thankfully, as we highlighted last week, another friend shows up and confronts Job in a way that corrects Job's thinking a bit. He, he calls for Job to not look at his painful situation as a moment where God was punishing him, but to look at this painful situation as a moment where God is perfecting and growing him. It appears as if this counsel was helpful in causing Job to reconsider his growing sentiment that, that God was against him because he does not argue with this friend as he did with the other three friends. But to this friend, he sits in silence and he listens to him. This friend's perspective was valuable in that it helped Job to reflect on the fact that although he was a good and godly man, he was not a perfect man. And contrary to what Job was thinking, his friend wants Job to understand that he belongs to God. In fact, he, he is, he is uh, God's uh, and he is uh, uh, God's friend. And, and it is precisely the, the reason why his pain and suffering is not pointless, but has purpose. And that purpose is to perfect, to produce and to purge. The purpose of Job's painful circumstance is to perfect Job's righteousness, to produce in Job more righteousness, and to purge from Job unrighteousness. His last friend's counsel ends in chapter 37. His wisdom certainly wasn't valuable. It was helpful. 
And it was vitally important. However, his friend's insight, while in no doubt was inspired, it, it really serves as the opening act to the main attraction that everyone really came to see. In chapter 38, God shows up and God speaks. It is almost as if a group of individuals were sitting around arguing about someone's behavior and all of a sudden that person shows up to clear the air. In chapter 38, after God no doubt has heard all of their arguments, they're going back and forth. The counsel that has been given, he's heard all of the chatter, all of Job's dismay, all of his friends, friends uh, bad theology. He, he's heard the wise counsel of his other friend. And here they go silent as God, the ultimate judge, the ultimate counselor. The most wise steps in to provide clarity. In chapter 38, what we find is that God has something to say to Job. Today, much of our discussion is going to be centered around the sovereignty of God. This is what Job seeks, uh, God seeks to explain to Job within these chapters is that he's explaining to Job, the Job son, my friend, I am sovereign. You've heard me say it before. I appreciate Piper's definition of sovereignty. Piper defines God's sovereignty is his right and power to do what he decides to do. Those are two crucial components. It is first the, the right. He, he has to be entitled. He, he has to have the right to do what he decides to do. But it can't stop there. He, he also must have the, the power, the ability to do what he decides to do. Right and power. That is what makes up God's sovereignty. In chapter 38... And the way we're going to go through this today, we're just really kind of going to walk through this. And, and it's a little different, but we'll, we'll just kind of walk through it and see how we land. But, but in chapter 38, beginning at verse 2, God says, Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Dress for action like a man. I will question you and you make it known to me, God says here, OK, Job, you have been interrogating me. Now it is time for the tables to turn. Now, now it is time for you to go on the witness stand. You, you have examined me this whole time. Now it's my turn to examine you, to, to ask you questions. You've had many questions that you have peppered me with. But, but now I am going to question you. And really the basis of God's questioning of Job is based on his statement that he makes there in verse 2 of chapter 38 when he says and asks the question, who darkens counsel by words? And here's the key phrase, without knowledge. In other words, Job, you have said a lot, you've argued a lot, you've shared a lot, you, you've shared your wisdom, you've shared your understanding, you've shared your concerns, you've made your arguments known about what has happened to you, and yet, what do you really know, Job? How much do you really understand? Do you really have a clue, Job? It's funny, just last week, our son, Miles, as we were preparing to have dinner, he grabbed his chair and he moved it to the head of the table. When I came to the dinner table and I seen Miles sitting there at the head of the table, I thought I would mess with Miles like my dad used to mess with us. 
My dad would always say when we would take the seat at the head of the table to be careful because the one who's sitting at the head of the table has to take care of the household bills. As such, I, I repeated this to Miles. I looked at Miles and I said, son, be careful. Since you're sitting at the head of the table, I want you to know if you take that seat, you're going to have to take care of the bills of the house. Much to my surprise, our confident young Miles responded with a smile on his face and nonchalantly said, okay, I'll take care of the bills of the house. I laughed and said, praise the Lord, but, but I took advantage of the teachable moment and I said, son, well, let me share with you about the bills of the house. I began to share with him about the mortgage payment and the water bill and the electricity and the cost for the internet and Wi-Fi that he loves so much. And, and I began to talk to him about the food that, that was about to be served to us. And I, and I talked to him about the, the snack closet that he loves to raid and the expense that comes with that. And I, and I said, that only scratches the, the surface of the cost and what it means to take care of the bills in the house. Miles, a little shaken now, but not wanting to back down from the challenge, responded, although he was somewhat clueless to what he was agreeing to, said, okay, then I'll go to work then to take care of the bills. To which my wife appropriately responded, boy, ain't nobody going to hire you. What Miles failed to understand and what he, he, he failed to miss is, on one hand, he had no clue of the level of responsibility that came with taking care of the bills. But not only that, not only did he have no clue of what it looked like to support our family, Miles has no ability to take care of the family. He has no idea of what it takes to take care of and support and, and feed and, and clothe and, and, and provide shelter for a family of five. But not only does he not have a clue, uh, he also doesn't have the ability to, to earn and take care of a family of our size. In essence, this is the point God is making and will be making to Job. God is saying, Job, why you have so many questions and I understand the pain you are feeling. Yet, Job, you have no idea what goes into running the world. And even if you volunteered to take on the job, Job, you couldn't do it anyway. In order to be sovereign, as God is sovereign, you must have both the right and the power. The right and ability. In chapters 38 and 39, it is God pulling back the curtain for Job to give an account of the bills of the house, so to speak. It is God saying, do you have any idea what has gone into creating and sustaining the very creation for which you exist in? I hear your questions, Job. I, I hear your thoughts. I, I hear your concerns. I understand they're coming from the place of suffering. I, I know that you have a lot of questions, but Job, you don't really understand what's going on. Consider how God says it. In verse 4 of chapter 38, God says, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? In other words, God is saying, 
man, did you create all of this? Because I, when I was doing it and, and, and when I was putting everything together, when I was hanging the stars in the sky, when I was speaking the, the seas into existence, when, when I was uh, uh, impregnating the earth with, with animals, when, when, when I was doing all of this, setting everything in motion. I, I'm sorry, Job, but when I looked around, I, I didn't see you. Anywhere. God continues in verse 12 when he says, have you commanded the morning since your days began and caused the dawn to know its place? In, in other words, it, was there at some point, Job, that you took over the responsibilities of making sure that the sun would rise and that the sun would set? In verse 16, God says, have you entered into the springs of the sea or walked in the recesses of the deep. In other words, he's saying, Job, I don't know. Last I checked, I don't know if you've seen these things, but when was the last time that you walked into the bottom of the ocean? In verse 18, he asked the question, have you comprehended the expanse of the earth? Do, do you really know how, how large and how big and, and how expansive all of this actually is? This 22 through 27, God questions Job and asks the question, do you control the weather, Job? He says there, have, have you entered the storehouses of the snow? Or, or have you seen the storehouses of the hell which I've reserved for the time of trouble, for the day of battle and war? What, what is the way to the place where the light is distributed? Can you show me uh, how I get there? Where, where, where the east wind is scattered upon the earth? Who has cleft a channel for the torrents of rain and a way for the thunderbolt? Jo Job, can, can you tell me how the, 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 the sky is cut where uh, there can be a space for the rain to come down and, and thunder and lightning to go? Can you tell me who is in control of the fact that the, that rain can be brought on a land where no man is or, or on the desert in which there is no man to, to satisfy the waste and desolate land and to make the ground spout, sprout with grass? Can, can you tell me, Job? Can, can you help me out? Can you help me understand? Do you know the way in which all of this happens? Do, do you know? No, I'm not talking about your, your science analysis and an answer to how these things take place. No, I'm asking you, do you know who controls that process? Can, can you help me understand that? Have you been a part of any of that? And God doesn't stop there. He goes on in verses 31 through 33 saying, Job, do you control the, the constella constellations and the stars? In verses 39, he, he says, do you control and provide for and make a way for the, the animals to, to be fed? He, he asks things like, do you provide, pray for the lions and the birds? Do you oversee the birth of new animals? Have you set their birth cycles in motion and in order? How do you care for the wild ox? Do you care for the ostrich? Do you order the locust? Do you give the horse his might? Do you make the hawk have its sore? Do you make it to where the eagle would be able to nest in the mountains? Do you do or understand or oversee any of this, Job? This is God recounting just a few of the things that he takes care of. It is God saying to Job, do you really understand the bills that come along with this house? First and foremost, listen, where were you when I created all of this? Uh, I, I put all of this together. I, I've done all of this. But but while you're, you're considering that where you were, won't you also consider where have you been when I've had to keep all of this in motion and functioning and taken care of? In chapter 40, God gives Job a chance to catch his breath and respond. He says in chapter 40, verse 2, Shall a fault finder contend with the Almighty? 
he argues with God, let him answer it. In other words, God is saying, Job, considering all of this, here's your first opportunity to have a response, to have a, a counter argument. To Job's credit, Job responds, nah, I'm good. I'm just going to sit here and, and listen. He says in verse 4 of chapter 40, in a very humbled way, behold, I am of small account. What shall I answer you? I, I lay my hand on my mouth. I literally will cover my mouth up. I've spoken once and I will not answer twice, but I will proceed no further. In other words, I, I won't say another word. Understand God in verses thir in chapters 38 and 39, he highlights his rights. His right to be sovereign. He, he highlights himself as the creator. He has the right to. To do what he decides to do because all of it belongs to him. Furthermore, he has the right to do what he decides to do because it is by his power all of it continues to operate. Brothers and sisters, we must be cognizant of this reality, especially when we look at our lives and we try to consider the idea and, and that, that, listen, our lives are our own Brothers and sisters, don't be so quick to, to snatch that reality. No, you are accountable to a creator, one that is greater than you are. Than you are. And, and he is one that is made possible your very existence. And so he is sovereign over your life because he is responsible for the very existence of your life. And while it is hard it is important even in the midst of our suffering to understand this reality yes we may go through difficult and dark times yes they may be troubling and painful just like job is going through but we are still accountable to god as our creator and our lives are not our own they belong to him. And so he highlights reality. He says, listen, I'm sovereign. I have the right to do what I decide to do. Because I'm the one who laid the foundation of the earth. And I'm the one who takes care of everything in the earth. Not only is this my house, but I pay all the bills. So honestly, Job, I, I, have, all, I, have, all, I, have, I have all the right to do as I decide to do. And then he stops there and says, okay, Job, you got any questions? And much to Job's credit, Job's credit Job, Job says, no, I'm good. I'll let you keep going, God. I'm humbled already. In chapters 40 through 41, it sort of shifts a bit to where now God extends a challenge to Job. Where initially in chapters 38 and 39, God puts on highlights his, his rights in chapters 40 through 41, God puts on highlights his power. Job, I laid the foundations of the world. I, I make sure it all keeps going. And so literally, I, I've got the right to do what I decide to do. But, but not only that, but I have the power to do what I decide to do. And the way God presents this to Job is by presenting to him a challenge to say, what power do you really have, Job? 
Do you really have that much power comparatively to me? Do, do, do you really have that, this, this power? Listen, Job, if I were to hand over the keys to the kingdom to you, if I were to give you and relinquish my rights and give you my rights, could you really do anything with it, Job? If I were to give you the entitlement to sovereignty, would you have the power to exact your sovereignty? This is what Job, God challenges Job with in the next two chapters. In verse 9 of chapter 40, God asked the question, Job, have you an arm like God? And can you thunder with a voice like this? Job, can you really do what I do, Job? I mean, seriously, Job, can, can, if I were to give you this, 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 this right, if, if I were to say, okay, go ahead and take care of the bills, the reality of it is, is that someone would have to respond as my wife responded to my son. Nobody's going to hire you. You don't have the ability, Job. In verses 10 through 14 of chapter 40, God continues his challenge. He says, adorn yourself with majesty and dignity. Clothe yourself with glory and splendor. Pour out the overflowings of your anger and look on everyone who is proud and abase him. Look on everyone who is proud and bring him low and tread down the wicked where they stand. Hide them in all Hide them all in the dust together. Bind their faces in the world below. Then will I also acknowledge to you that your own right hand can save you. You get what God is saying to Job there, right? He's saying, listen, listen, okay, uh, if you're so powerful, then, then go ahead and, and you try to take the throne and you begin to deal with those who are proud and those who are wicked and those who do wrong. Go ahead and pour out your wrath on those individuals. If you, if you uh, are so sure that you're able to do it, then, then go ahead and you try it. You try to take the reins. If you, if you say you can take these reins, you go ahead and pour out power and deal with the wicked and the evil. And the reality is God knows, God knows Job's answer to this question is that I can't do anything. To fix the evil problem. Even if you gave me the right, Job must acknowledge the fact that I cannot eradicate evil. I can't deal with the proud. I can't humble those who are lifted up in arrogance. I, I can't deal with the wicked. And God is saying, okay, listen, listen, I'm challenging you. Let, let me see you deal with them. Let me see you do something about it. And if you can... I'll acknowledge and affirm your power. Here you are. You complain about evil. You complain about wickedness. You complain about the proud, but, but you can't do anything to eradicate them. He, he goes on in verses 15 through chapter 41. And God says, listen, you can't even deal with the evil problem. Let, 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 me, let me try to bring it down a little bit lower uh, and, and a little bit more real to you. you let, me, let me challenge you with, with another idea of, of, of saying, okay, well, you probably can't handle that. But let me try to uh, challenge you. Maybe you can handle behemoth. He's saying, listen, you, you, maybe you can handle this, 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 this behemoth, this, 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 uh, this uh, powerful field animal, this large field, field animal. Let me see you deal with it. God says in verse 24, he issues a challenge. Verse 24 of chapter 40. He says, can one... Take behemoth by his eyes or pierce his nose with a snare. In other words, what God is saying is like when you look at behemoth, that large land animal of the field, the only way you've been able to get him down is by sneaking up on him. But you in no way can take him down head on and straight up. You don't even 
out. You don't even have the power to deal with him in that way. God speaks of another large animal of the sea. In chapter 41, verses 1, when he talks about Leviathan, he says, listen, you can't even fish him out with a hook. In verse 8 of chapter 41, he says, if you try to lay your hands on him, you'd remember the battle. And you never try it again. God's point is simple. You can't even handle these small things. What makes you think you can handle the world and the problems that exist within it? You don't even have power to deal with with the very animals that exist on on your, your very planet without struggle. What in the world makes you think that you could deal with all of the problems of the world better than I can? So God has made the argument. That I'm sovereign. I've got the right to do what I decide to do. But I'm also, I'm also sovereign in that I've got the power to do the things that I decide to do. And that far exceeds Job. What you're able to do. So while you're questioning me, I hear your concerns and I'm not afraid of your questions. I'm I'm not I'm not offended by your questions. And I don't want any of us thinking that God is sitting here just offended that Job has had questions. But but what God wants Job to consider and understand and wants him really to embrace and submit to is his sovereignty in saying, wait a minute, wait a minute, Job, while you have all of these questions, in all reality, who are you to ask these questions? I love you, Job. I'm good with you. I haven't turned my back on you. You're not an enemy, but, but I, I, I need you to really consider that, that I am the one who is sovereign. I'm the one who's laid the foundations of this world. I'm the one who's responsible for keeping and sustaining it. I'm the one who has the power to keep and sustain all of these things. Not you. Leave the question that Job and you and I are left with is what can we learn and what comfort can we take in the midst of our suffering by understanding and embracing and submitting to the sovereignty of God? I think we fail to understand what takes place here if our conclusion is that God is saying, in many ways, I just get to do what I want to do and you have nothing to say about it. Oftentimes in my, my probably my impatience with my children, I may come to them and tell them, hey, listen, I want you to go ahead and get ready. We're about to go somewhere and they'll respond and say, well, where are we going? And I'm just like, listen, I just told you to get ready. I ain't got time to be asking all these questions. Just get ready. And I, I believe we, we, we almost hear it as, as sort of this, that, that, that mindset of we've heard it all before. It's like, hey, well, why am I doing this? Well, because I told you so. And I don't really think that we're fully hearing what God is saying if that's the only conclusion that we draw from this. I don't think that we're hearing rightly if the only conclusion that we bring out of this is God saying, because I told you so. 
If we read this as God throwing his weight around or boasting in his right and power and in his sovereignty, I think we read this wrong. And that's not what Job hears. Don't get it twisted. Job is not embarrassed into submission by the fact that he can't answer God's questions. He's not beaten into humility by, by God overwhelming him with, with these questions here. He, he doesn't hear God justifying himself. But what he does hear is God proclaiming his sovereignty and worthiness of being trusted. And this is what Job submits to and embraces and learns. And this is what you and I must embrace and learn and submit to, especially in the midst of our suffering. That is the reality that if anything, God's sovereignty can be, can be, can be trusted in the midst of what we're going through. That even in the midst of our pain, even in, in the midst of the dark times and the difficult things that we go through, we can trust both his right and his power and, to make the decisions to do what he decides to do. This is what we see Job in Job 42. When he finally responds, this is what we see he learns and receives and understands and embraces and even appreciates. I want you to read with me in Job 42, beginning at verse 2. It says, Job answered the Lord and he says, okay, God, I know. That you can do all things. And that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore I have uttered what I did not understand. Things too wonderful for me which I did not know. Hear and I will speak. I will question you and you make it known to me. I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. God, I, I know you can do all things. Know that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Job then quotes God, the question that God asked Job, who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Job says, I hear you, God. My response is this. I said some stuff, not realizing, I, I, I don't understand. I'm clueless. Some of this stuff is just too big for me. Here and I will speak. I will question you and you make it known to me. God, I, I hear you, and I was just hearing you with my ears before, but, but, but now I really get it. Because of that, and I understand where I've gone wrong, so I repent and take comfort in what you said. There are at least four things, and I'll just run through them quickly. That wasn't a long introduction. We've been preaching the whole time. There are four things that, that, that we can learn from Job here in his response, his confession, and his acknowledgement of God. That, that, that we can learn from what he, what he says in response to God. Four things, especially in the midst of our suffering, that, that, that we got to grab, that we have to get. This is what it looks like to embrace and submit and trust in God's sovereignty. Very first thing is that he acknowledges God's power. He says, I know that you can do all things. 
I know, God, I, I, I know, I, I, I look out and I see your power. Now that you've, you've illuminated and shown it to me, you, you've shown me that you've got the right, but you've shown me that you've sustained all of these things. You, you've shown me uh, very clear that, that, that uh, versus you, I, I am impotent. I, I, I have no power like your power. I, I have to trust in the fact that you can do all things. And, and I have to trust in the fact that if you can do all things, you can certainly work in my situation. I, I got to just trust and acknowledge your power that, that regardless of what I'm going through, regardless of, of the difficulty that I'm facing, regardless of the pain that I'm, I'm up against, regardless of how big and how strong and how, how, how insurmountable the pain and the difficulty that I'm going through is, no matter how powerful it seems, guess what? I have to acknowledge the fact that you're more powerful. God, I know that you can do all things. Brothers and sisters, as you're going through what you're going through, as you're, you're navigating the darkness of life at times and, and suffering and pain, you must, in the midst of that, it, it embrace God's sovereignty by acknowledging his power even in the midst of what you're going through. Yes, it's painful. Yes, it's difficult. Yes, it's big. And yes, it's a tall mountain. But guess what? You have a God who is stronger, who is bigger, who is better. God can do all things. And that's the comfort his sovereignty brings us is that in the, rea the reality that, that we have a God who is in control. And, and not only is he in control, but he's able. He acknowledges God's power. He goes on and he says, and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. I love this. He acknowledges God's power, but he also acknowledges that God has a purpose. The reality of it is, is when we consider sovereignty, sort of this, this, this free reign to do as you decide to do, both having the right and the power to do what one decides to do, we must understand that God's sovereignty is not a weapon that he wields carelessly or without purpose. But God and Job sees God now as being very intentional. There is nothing that happens that happens and, and takes God by surprise. There's nothing that happens that is happening out of place. There, there's, there's nothing that is happening that, that, that is sort of caught God, God off guard. I, I, I know I've said it before, but, but COVID didn't catch God off guard. God is not surprised by these things. No, no, no. Everything that is happening is happening with, with a purpose and plan. And God has a purpose. God is intentional. That, that's, that's how we can understand God's sovereignty as we are navigating through our, our suffering and our difficulty, even though it's painful. Even though it's hard, no one's denying that and the difficulty in it, but it's not pointless. We can trust that God utilizes his sovereignty with purpose. Brothers and sisters, hope that as you are navigating your, your difficulties and your challenges, I, I pray that you can understand in the midst of it that it's not without purpose. The God is in control. He, he knows what he's doing. He, 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 he hasn't left the car unattended. No, no, he still has his hands on the wheel. He, 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 he's in total control. Thirdly, and this is good as well, Job first acknowledges, okay, God, I acknowledge your power. Secondly, I acknowledge that you have purpose. But here, thirdly, I, I, I acknowledge that God has power over his plan. He says, 
I know that you can do all things and then no purpose of yours can be thwarted. I, I, I acknowledge that I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. I, I, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. OK, I, I acknowledge you got power. I, I acknowledge that you have purpose. But now I have to acknowledge that you have power over your purpose, that you have power over your plan, that, that not only can you begin something, but you can make sure that it gets finished. That not only are you intentional, but everything that you intend to do, guess what? It's done. That there are no doors that God opens that, that man can close. That there, there are no doors that God closes that, that man can reopen, family. I, I pray, brothers and sisters, especially as you're navigating, uh, navigating, the, the, your, your suffering, sometimes we tend in the midst of our suffering to think that something has gone awry or, or wrong or, or, or something is off kilter. But, but no, no, no. God's plan hasn't been thwarted. It, it hasn't been thrown off. No, if God has started it, he's going to finish it. Yes, if he's begun a good work in you, he's going to bring it to completion. That is speaking salvifically. And the reality is, is that we can understand even in our lives as we are dealing and living practically the very real application that no. Whatever God has purposed in our lives. He's going to bring it to completion and for our good. He acknowledges God's power. He acknowledges God's purpose and plan. And he acknowledges God has power over his plan. The last thing that he acknowledges is that God, he acknowledges God's position. He quotes God in, chapter, in verse 3 of chapter 42. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? He says, I heard you ask me that question. And here's my answer. God, I've uttered what I didn't understand. Stuff that was too wonderful for me, which I didn't know. God, I, 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 I didn't see you before. I only heard you, but, but, but now I see you. And, and because of that, I, I have to repent. God, I acknowledge the fact that, that your ways are, are above my ways, that, that you are greater, that you have more insight, you have more wisdom, that you, you know more and see more than I see. God, I acknowledge that reality. All I can do is just humble myself, humble myself before that, that truth. I, I, I just have to see that, that reality that, that you see more than I do. I think I shared this once before. I think me and me and Millicent, we we went to go see um, Cirque du Soleil one time, and, and it was here at, at, at Bankers Life Field House. And and the seats that we had, we 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 couldn't sit on the floor. We couldn't afford to do that, but we sat up top. And so I I I, I it was funny to to sit up top because as I was looking out and I was watching the show take place, it, it, everything was time. There was music and lights and things that were happening. If you sat on the floor, all you could see was the show that was unfolding before you. But where we happened to be sitting, I could actually see down into the AV and control booth. And so I could actually anticipate and see a little bit more of what was about to happen because I could see the fact that the, the controller, the person that was in control, actually was anticipating and, and had more understanding and more insight of the whole show and how the whole show fit together, not just what was happening in front of him, but, but he knew exactly how, uh, where everything was going. And the reality of it is, brothers and sisters, we must understand that God's perspective is different than ours. All we are doing is we're seeing life just sort of play out in front of us. But God, on the other hand, he's in the control booth. He sees everything. He knows all the cues. He knows how the whole thing fits together. So we must humble ourselves from the reality that says, no, God, not only do I know you're powerful, not only do I know you act with purpose and that there's a plan, not only do I acknowledge that, yes, you've got power over the plan, but I got to humble myself into understanding the fact that, listen, you see more than I see. 
Family, I pray that in the midst of what you're going through, you can resolve now before you get there. And I'm going to trust that God sees the end and the whole of this thing. It's painful for me. I, I'm not going to lie. It's hard for me. I, I, I'm, I'm not going to lie. I'm going to struggle. I'm, I'm going through it. It's, it's tough. But, but I'm going to trust in the fact that God sees the whole picture. To bring this to a close, in Job 42.10, we read that the Lord restored the fortunes of Job when he had prayed for his friends and the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. You can't help but not be encouraged by the fact that God is a God of restoration. That he's a God that can fix what has been broken. That he can make right what seemed, uh, seemingly has gone wrong. That, that he can wipe away tears that that he, he can truly make old things new and improved that although you've gone through it God can bring you out of it he's a God who can turn midnights into mornings we, we we can't help but 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 be encouraged by by the fact that he he can present a uh, uh, use uh, take us out of the present pain pain and and bring us into the dawn of a new day it, it's without question that this note of restoration here that God speaks to that says, listen, what God does in the midst of all of this is that he brings it back to Job and he blesses him twofold. It, it, you can't help but not be encouraged. And this is written to encourage you and I to be patient through the pain of our suffering. To trust in the sovereignty of God, no matter what, even in the darkest moments, no matter what's going on, continue to be patient and trust in God because God is a God of restoration. When things get dark, we can trust that God will work things out for our good. This is why God sees fit to, to place this there for us so that you and I can be encouraged in this reality that this is who God is. Perhaps you don't believe me. But this is what Brother James teaches in James chapter 5. Beginning at verse 7, James says, Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and the late rains. You also be patient. If you jump down to verse 10, he says, As an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. In other words, what James is saying there is you got to look to Job as an example to you and I in the midst of everything that we're going through in the moments of darkness and difficulties to remain patient, to wait on the Lord, to remain steadfast in the midst of it, to trust in his sovereignty, to trust in the fact of who God is, to never allow our situation to color who God is, but to trust in the fact that God is a God who will deal with us either in this life or the next with compassion and mercy no, no matter what we're going through even when that darkness pushes us to the brinks of death we can trust in the fact and the reality that God is a God of restoration God is a God who is working things out for our good God is a God who will who will make our crooked ways straight, who will wipe away our tears, who will fix our broken situations. We can trust in the sovereignty of God. And I pray today, family, especially if you're going through something, but even now, before you go through something, that this can be your resolve. No matter what I face, I'm going to trust in the sovereignty of God. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word. I thank you for who you are. 
I thank you for just the clarity of your, your scriptures, Lord God, the encouragement and the conviction that comes from it. God, so many of us have so many things that we're praying about, that we are navigating, going through, struggling with, Lord God. I, I pray today, God, that you would enable us, Lord, in the midst of what we're going through, to not look at your sovereignty as something that is bad, but look at it as something that should be embraced and that we can be comforted by. God, I pray, Lord God, that you would minister to the hearts of your people that in the midst of going through difficult and tough times that you can trust that you have the power, that you have a plan, that you have power over your plan and trust that your position and your perspective is better than ours. God, we love you. We thank you. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Family, I love you. God bless you. Have a wonderful week.